Welcome to the History Lord. You join us here and uh, we're in Allgate Square and today I thought we'd do a little wander around uh, just this area. So it's a small area, Allgate, and uh, well, let's start with why it's got its name. So, um, James, roll titles. Welcome to London. So how does Allgate get its name? Well, if we come over here, just over here, just down there, it says Site of Bastion. There we are. Wonderful. And this is on the corner of uh, modern day Duke's Place. Now, the Bastion was the Allgate, but how did it get its name? John Stowe, the famous uh, 16th century historian and uh, map maker, uh, said it came from Oldgate. It was a corruption of Oldgate. Uh, there was another historian in 1918 who said it was a corruption of Alegate. Uh, there was a pub next door, and so it got a corruption from there. Some say it comes from a corruption of Allgate, A W -L, L, which is a free for all, so anyone can get through here. And some say it was a corruption of Earlgate, uh, which was an old uh, Anglo Saxon word for foreigner. I think we've mentioned in one of our previous videos that a foreigner was just anyone who lived outside of the city of London. Now the first gate was mentioned here in 1052 and uh, over the years it was built and rebuilt and uh, the first incarnation we believe was just here, uh, two round um, towers and then it was rebuilt in the 12th century and then the 13th century uh, with square towers and it was finally moved from here in 1761 and it was moved just a little bit further down the road to Bethnal Green. What happened to it? Nobody knows. Demolished over the years and just disappeared. For those of you who are familiar with the area, we know that this isn't the site of the Allgate itself. That's a few yards further to the south, but we had a few technical issues on the day and we didn't have any footage to show you. So I went back a few weeks later and I've recorded it. And this is the actual site of the Allgate. And it's at the south of Allgate Square, just opposite a well-known pharmacy and coffee shop. So there you go, back on track again. Now, as it was a fortification, it did have portcullis uh, that came down. And as a fortification, it was actually breached twice. First in 1381, in uh, the Peasants' Revolt. Lots of people got through here into the city of London. And also, I think it was 1481 uh, or 14, no, 1471, get me dates right, it's 1471 um, in the Siege of London, uh, just after the Battle of Barnet, it was uh, breached again. One of the people who actually lived here, it was a military fortification, but they let out the rooms, was a chap called Geoffrey Chaucer. You may have heard of him. He wrote a, a great tome called The Canterbury Tales. And uh, he actually lived here whilst he was a customs officer. I think he lived here for about 12 years. But as I say, demolished in or removed in 1761 and taken down to Bethnal Green. Now we're going to have a little wander around here now. And uh, as we go down, we, we, if James just does a quick turnaround. We're actually here outside what is now called the Allgate School. And uh, this was founded, I think it was 1709. Uh, as the Sir John Cass Foundation. But in two, uh, September 2020, uh, the pupils had a, uh, a vote to change the name because John Cass uh, was a notorious uh, trader in slaves in the North Atlantic slave trade. So they wanted to disassociate themselves with him. Uh, I think they had five or six names to choose from and the pupils themselves chose Allgate School, which is nice and simple. It's the only state-funded school inside the City of London, and I do believe its Ofsteds are very, very good indeed. But there you go. So we're going to head down that way now, and we're going to show you um, where Allgate gets its name from today. So let's go this way. So here we are. It's uh, just around the corner from uh, the old Allgate itself, and uh, we're on the junction of Leadenhall Street and Fenchurch Street. And we're looking at this structure behind me. This is the new Allgate pump. The original Allgate pump mentioned in the uh, reign of King John around about 1200 was just by the Allgate itself. Uh, this arrived in 1876 and is now a Grade 2 listed structure. More of that in a moment. Now the original pump itself, on the line of the old Roman wall, um, supplied water for many, many people in this area. And uh, according to uh, legend, 
I shall read this part. According to legend, it had, uh, it was in appearance, it was bright and sparkling and cool and of an agreeable taste. Sounds wonderful, doesn't it? You would like that, James, wouldn't you? Agreeable. Agreeable very taste. Agreeable. A very agreeable taste. Now, the original source of the Allgate pump was a stream that started up in uh, Hampstead in North London and wound its way down to Allgate and then eventually into the Thames. As it traversed all of that lovely landscape through North London, it went through several uh, cemeteries and plague pits and the calcium from the bodies leached into the watercourse and eventually came out at the Allgate pump. So the agreeable taste was the centuries of bodies that went before. Tasty. Tasty, yes. It did cause an outbreak. It was known as the Allgate uh, epidemic at one point and the pump was shut and they moved the pump here and it was put onto the mains uh, water and uh, epidemic stopped, thankfully. Now, Allgate yourself, let's come over here, James. There we are, doing my little bit. 1876, this was uh, unveiled and it has here as its head uh, a wolf and that is a nod apparently to the last wolf that was shot in the city of London when that was I can't find out but you may know and if you do leave it in the comments below wonderful thank you very much uh, what else can I tell you about this this is now unofficially the start of the east end of London the city stops here and back there behind James is now called the east end of London I think it was the uh, 1860 book by Charles Dickens, the uncommercial traveller. He mentioned it, uh, the what had to go to Allgate Pump one day. It's also, uh, I've got to read this. I've got the quote, but I can't remember quotes because I'm getting old these days. Um, it was quoted once that east of the Allgate Pump, people cared for nothing but drink, vice and crime. Well, coming from the East End myself, I wholeheartedly agree, but there you go. I'm joking. I'm not into vice at all, but, or crime, so I'm, I'm waffling again. Anyway, it's very noisy here on uh, this Saturday morning that we're filming, so we're going to go back over there and we're going to look at uh, a church and the station. So, see you in a moment. Uh, James, James, over here, please, please, thank you. We did all about police boxes elsewhere on the channel, so try and find the video if you can, uh, but come here, follow me, this way, this way, this way, this way. Let me, uh, pick up this. We're going to go inside this little garden here because it's a nice little oasis in the middle of uh, Allgate and uh, <laughs> yes anyway there's, there's some people about that we don't want to see. So come, 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 come hither, come hither, look nice little bench. So wonderful, wonderful. Now it's a bit damp so I'm not going to sit down today but this is St Botolph's without uh, very strange name, it just meant it was without, outside the city walls, so that's what without. There's a twin, or it's a, got a sister church, which is about a quarter mile that way, and that's now called St Bottles Within, so within the city walls, but there you go. Now the earliest known church uh, of St Bottles was around about 1115, and it was founded by Matilda, who was wife of Henry I. Uh, it was also associated with a priory that was associated just inside the city walls here that was called Holy Trinity. So it was rebuilt in 1621 and it was lucky enough to escape the Great Fire of London. Now it was again rebuilt and uh, refurbished between 1741 and 1744 uh, but sadly this was um, destroyed or partly destroyed during the Second World War in the Blitz in uh, 1941. This particular church was bombed. They gave it Grade 1 listed status in January of 1950, along with about five or six other churches in, in the City of London, and it was restored, and it was due to be reopened in 1964-65, but there was a fire during the restoration, and so it was in 1965 that it was finally opened by the Bishop of London and uh, the Lord Mayor of London and Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth the Queen Mother. During the Victorian times, this was also known as the Church of Prostitutes. Now because Allgate back in then, or this part of Allgate was on a, a traffic island, more or less as it is today, um, the prostitutes would, or the ladies of the night, to you know, make it a bit more polite, would um, walk around here. And so the police were very reluctant to come onto the lit line, the traffic island, and arrest them. So 
got the name, the Church of Prostitutes. Now, when I was younger, my mother, especially my mother, used to take me out on little days out all into London and uh, she hated trains and the underground. So we only ever went on buses. So I remember pulling up here at Allgate bus station to change buses to go into the city of London. And uh, I actually remember this quite well. As a kid, it was a, a landmark for me. I knew this is where we changed buses. And I do believe, I do remember, vaguely in the back of my head, um, that um, it was a homeless shelter back in the 1970s and early 80s. I'm not sure if it still is, but uh, they do lots of charitable work. Now, next door, or just a couple of doors down, is Allgate Station. So let's have a chat all about that. So our next stop is here, Allgate Station. Uh, first opened in 1876, and then the line was extended in 1882 round to Tower Hill to complete the Circle Line. The station as we see it today was opened in 1926, and it was designed by Charles Clark, who was the senior and chief architect of the Metropolitan Railway. Now, in 1933, it became part of the London Passenger Regional Board, uh, London Transport to you and me, and it's been that way ever since. And in 1941, this became the terminus for the Metropolitan Line. Right up to date, modern history, on the 7th of July 2005, uh, a dark day for London, four suicide bombers set off bombs on three underground trains and a bus, killing 52 people in total. Well, one of the first bombs to be set off was here. A Circle Line train had left Liverpool Street, was just pulling into Allgate Station when it blew up and seven people sadly died. Move forward. These days it's still the um, terminus for the Metropolitan Line and uh, also has a circle line running through it and I think it has, um, oh, I think it's about 12 or 14 Metropolitan Line services leave here every hour and I think there's five or six uh, circle lines in each direction. But there you go. Anyway, a bit of a downer on that one with 7-7, um, seven, seven. I'm sorry about that, but it is history. So we're going to end on a high note and we're going to go round the corner and tell you all about the fantastic Petticoat Lane. So this is our last stop for the day. This behind me is now called Middlesex Street, but we still know it as Petticoat Lane. Now back in the Tudor times, it was known as Hog Lane and it ran outside the city walls and this is where some of the city merchants kept um, their pigs. It's also where pigs were driven down uh, as an alternative route to get into um, Smithfield Market about um, three quarters of a mile away to the west. It was in 1590 that people started coming here to start trading, especially in second-hand clothing, and then by 1608 a few cottages appeared. It's still a, quite a pretty lane and still a nice countryside area outside the walls of the city, so much so the Spanish ambassador to James I built a residence here. Sadly by 1665 the plague had come and uh, City of London and this area lost about a fifth of its population to the plague. Moving forward it was the uh, 17th early 18th century that the Huguenots from France, the Protestant Huguenots were being driven out and uh, they came over here into exile and they set up their weaving establishments especially in the new town of Spitalfields which is just a bit further north. Now Spitalfields just to give context, uh, is a corruption of hospital fields. It's where they used to dry, uh, wash and dry all of the sheets. Um, and so the Huguenots came over and the weaving and the dyeing industry. So they used to dye their cloth there as well and hang it out in the vast fields that used to be there on tenter hooks. They would stretch it out in tenter fields and they'd be on tenter hooks. So it was held at great pressure and all this. And so even today, if you're on tenter hooks, it means you're you know, you're, the pressure's there for you to learn something. You're on ten hooks, that's where it comes from. Anyway, I'm digressing. Let's go back to Middlesex Street. They set up their little market down here unofficially and they would sell their goods and their, and their clothing that they manufactured. Moving to the 1870s, 1880s, this is when the Jewish population were being driven out of Eastern Europe and the pogroms in Russia and they came and set up establishments here. They took over the manufacture of clothes as well and this became a very popular Jewish area. Even up until the Second World War though, the market was unregulated and not illegal but certainly unofficial and uh, police cars would often drive down here with their bells ringing and so would fire engines occasionally just to try and disrupt the Sunday morning market. It was an act of Parliament in 1936 that gave it its rights to Sunday trading and it's been that way ever since. 
Moving forward again, the 1970s, 1980s saw an influx of uh, Eastern Asians coming in. And they set up mainly in the Brick Lane area, but they did overspill into um, the Petticoat Lane area. Now it became Middlesex Street in about 1830, just to make it a little bit nicer than calling it Petticoats, I would imagine. And it's been that way ever since. Now if you come down here on a Sunday morning, it's a bustling area, uh, not just um, clothing, you can also get uh, very good street food and uh, some great coffee and some great uh, specialty teas as well. Take it from me. Now, I'm going to reminisce again. When I was a child, as I mentioned earlier, my mother used to bring me out all over London, especially on the buses, and uh, Sunday mornings um, we would, not every Sunday morning, but certain Sunday mornings we'd come here, and my mother would take me up and down um, Petticoat Lane along with my grandmother, my late grandmother as well. I was in awe of the barkers, the people who would shout to try and entice you to their stall, or the hawkers who would sell you something as that was insignificant but to them it was pure gold it was wonderful their, their imagination held no bounds my favorite though were the people who sold the porcelain and the dinner services they were incredible they'd have a basket they would set up so they'd sell you a six-piece dinner service they'd set up the six dinner plates that's not all they're putting the six side plates they're putting the sauces they'd put in the cups they'd lift it all up and they'd throw it in the air and they'd catch it as well not just to show you their skills but to show you how robust this particular piece of porcelain was and then the bidding would start well not bidding they'd say the first you know this costs 50 pounds but the, you know i'm not asking 50 i'm not asking 40 or 30 the first five hands that go up 20 pounds a piece and hands would fly up it was a marvelous place so as a young chap who was you know destined to be an actor one day these characters they're all up there and i've used a few of them on stage in the past anyway i'm reminiscing come down here on a sunday morning to Petticoat Lane Market. It's a marvellous place. There you go. I'm going to stop the video now. Thanks for watching. We do hope you enjoy these videos. Um, especially, we, we, make, we, we enjoy making them for you, especially on a chilly morning like this. It's a, you know, it may be April, but the wind is hurling through and my hands are very cold, but we enjoy making them for you. James does as well, don't you, James? I do. Say it with more conviction. I you do. <laughs> There you go. Uh, if you want to know what James does, other than make these videos, uh, have a look for Last Nine Films. If you want to see what I do, go to historylaw.co.uk. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you very soon. Take care.